Mohawk, um, uh, you know, 101, but I guess not. You guys expect Cult of the Severed Head or something like that. <laughs> um, so I gave this presentation a few times to my family, and they asked me, and I got all done, I spoke really quickly, and probably made all the newbie mistakes. They asked me, well, you know, that's really great, but where, where did it all start? So, I was like, that's a great question. Um, actually, humans have been kind of venerating the head or practicing burial practices where um, they let the body be, what they call like, not exhumation, excarnation, where they lay the body out like you could see, typically think of the Native Americans where the bones are picked clean. And oftentimes they would actually keep just the head because it's so much easier and compact and small. <laughs> than having to carry around a bag of bones or something like that for ancestor worship. Um, while the title of my presentation is Cult of the Severed Head, I want to actually focus more on the Celts, and I suppose I should have put that. I kind of figured it would be obvious, but perhaps not. Um, the Celts weren't the only ones, however, who had a Cult of the Severed Head or revered severed heads. Um, actually, our friends, the Norse, have Nimir's head, which is carried by Odin, um, who's said to speak secret knowledge to Odin. Um, and, of course, we, to get a cult of the severed head, somebody has to be severing heads. <laughs> so, the Celts actually were head hunters, and I, you know, not to burst anyone's bubbles, it's okay. Um, usually this is told to people in the most caustic way that can possibly be said to them. So, um, there's actually a lot of debate among scholars uh, regarding the cult, if there is actually a cult of the severed head. Uh, Anne Ross, one of the strongest supporters of the cult of the severed head, Dr. Anne Ross, by the way, um, she says because it's a motif on all uh, Celtic artwork, I mean, you can look at shields and, you know, cave drawings and clothing and helmets and all kinds of things, they all have kind of a head motif. Uh, Ron Hutton, however, who you might know from Triumph of the Moon, he says the frequency with it, you know, with which these motifs appear just means it was kind of a thing they liked to draw, <laughs> or you know, kind of a, a thing they liked. Um, and even if you think about that today, I mean, you see skulls on everything. I mean, I have skulls on my window shade for my vehicle. You know, it's, they're everywhere, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is a member of the cult of the severed head. <laughs> um, this isn't, I'm not sure of other groups, I know in ADF there was a um, special interest group that studied the cult of the severed head. However, I haven't heard anything from them, so I don't know if they're defunct or if I got dropped off the list somehow. <laughs> Uh, I haven't even actually really discussed this with my grove mates, so I could be the only one interested in this. <laughs> no? Okay. Um, now, I will admit the skull is probably a ritual item, or the head, I'm going to kind of use those words interchangeably. Um, to have a cult, though, you need, to me, from my understanding of maybe just the modern meaning of the word, to have a cult, you need a strong, charismatic leader who can cash checks. Your checks. <laughs> and also, you know, you can't meet your family, blah, blah, blah. And my friends over here, they haven't managed to figure out how to cash checks yet, which is probably good. <laughs> um, one of the most famous talking heads, speaking of you know, cashing checks, was from Bren the Blessed. I'll get into him a little later, um, but there's also some information surrounding screaming skulls in Britain, where if you remove them from their location, their current location, they scream. They cause storms, they haunt people, so you can't move them from where they're located, you can't sell them, you can't do anything else. Then you can't get rid of. Now going back to the Celts being headhunters, that's actually not a strange thing, as some might think. Um, tribes in Papua New Guinea recall their ancestors, you know, like their grandparents, being headhunters or knowing of headhunters. And the interviews I've seen with the tribesmen, they say pretty much the same thing that the Celts believe, that the energy from the head transfers to the living. You can use the, the head's power, so to speak, to add to your own for protection and that sort of thing. Um, Herbert Kuhn, a 
in his book, The La Cension de Humanity, uh, said the act of taking heads during prehistoric times marked man's discovery of the spiritual principle residing in the head, not in the whole body, or your left butt cheek. <laughs> So I'm sorry, pronunciation is not my strong suit, and especially Greek. Um, Deidaris Sikoulis uh, was a Greek historian who wrote his observations down between 60 and 30 BC, and he's the one that made the ob observation of the Celts taking heads in battle and then uh, storing them in cedar and jars, and then walking them away in trunks and stuff. So whenever anyone showed up or when they had a moot or, you know, somebody was over, they'd pull these heads out and say, you know, this head is so important to me, I turned down large sums of money for it. Um, however, the biggest spin doctor on the Celts had one tiny little entry, and by spin doctor I mean Caesar, he said, that Indotomeris, the leader of the Treviri, was slain and his head was carried into the camp. That's it. That's his one entry that I could find on the cult of the severed head, which you think he would have gone to town on that one. <laughs> um, something that I think makes the Celts unique as headhunters is that they would take the heads of their allies too. Um, and I think, based on my UPG, uh, unverified personal gnosis, you've probably heard Mark talk about that. <laughs> um, I think that they would try to capture the head of their enemies to ensure that person was reborn into their tribe. That's my thought. Um, but of course, like Brian the Blessed, his head was cut off by his men at his request. So they captured their allies' heads as well. Um, in the lore, specifically the Toy or Tain, as people like to call it, or the Cattle Raid of Cooley, um, Cuhulan is set upon by 12 men, and he chops their heads off, and then he drives 12 stones into the ground and puts a head on each stone. So we have that from the lore. Um, and for me, the Cult of the Sever Head came about um, actually because I was reading this book. <laughs> And there were two temples, one at, forgive me, I'm probably going to this, Rokutus, Rokutus, um, and one at Enhamont, which is in southern France or southern Gaul. The first one here, and you can look at the book later, is this one's Rokutus, where they actually have standing stones with niches cut for heads to be placed inside of them. Um, the one at Entremont, which is this one on the left, you're right, um, this is actually a pillar inside the sanctuary, from within the sanctuary, and there were actually 20 heads found inside that sanctuary as well, so we also have archaeological evidence of this sort of veneration. Um, and it's also said that the Celts would capture their enemies' heads and take them to the Druids, who are said to then peel the flesh off, empty the contents out, decorate them with gold, and make to make them into a vessel for libations. And the warriors would then also, I thought it was kind of interesting, take the contents and mix them with lime and make it what they call a brain ball, which they would use as a sling stone. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Babe was killed with one. I know Linda talked about me. She was killed with one. <laughs> um, there's a big thing, and I don't want to talk about it, the holy wells. And, the, and there's holy wells all over um, Britain, England, or let's try that again. England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, even into France and that sort of thing. Um, and I was wondering myself after doing this whole presentation, they associate holy wells with anything, and especially the head. Well, there. So I went back and looked at some of the lore last night, and actually they had a few tales where one was specifically a druid knew of some monks moving into the next valley, which was technically his land, and he wasn't very happy with that. But he was kind of coaxed into letting them do that. 
Well, his wife was really not happy, so she invited one of the ladies from their group over, and so they went berry picking, and she ended up cutting the other lady's head off. <laughs> and actually, a lot of times, a well is said to sprout from where the blood falls. And there's a lot, and I know Linda covered, there's a lot of holy wells with goddesses specifically associated with them and with the land. There is a specific well in Ishtun where it doesn't actually have a, you know, an actual skull, but it has a carved skull that's actually below the waterline of this particular well. And since the wells are um, considered to dispense healing or help with luck or love or, you know, what have you, the trick with this well is you have to hold your breath and dunk your head in the water and kiss the skull. <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, and through my research, there were a couple of uh, tales that I found particularly striking. Uh, one was at the well of the head, or I think it would be said to Mubara Um There was a lady who committed suicide 230 years ago. And being a suicide, she couldn't be buried on holy ground, so they went and buried her in the moor, and somebody came across her head, and of course the, you know, the village elders was like, oh, this is important. So they took her head and decided that it was the cure for epilepsy. And so, as far as I can tell, to this, this day, somebody in that village has the head. It's a, you know, a descendant, you know, passed on from down to descendants. Um, and they produce the head, I'm sure now for a sum of money, to get a cure specifically for epilepsy, actually, which I thought was quite interesting. It seems not very specific. Yeah. And there were, um, what was the other one? There was one for whooping cough, too, drinking from yeah. it. Oh, yes? They just have to touch it, or do you know what uh, Oh, no, they have to drink from it. 